everybody, Jason Wright here with a very, very special episode of ThreatWise TV. And I know I say that a lot, but this <laughs> one is more special than most because I have a most amazing guest here for us today to talk about how a security company protects a security company like Cisco. So for that, I brought in Steve Martino, Senior VP and Chief Information Security Officer of Cisco, the man that's responsible for keeping us secure. Great job, by the way. I haven't been hacked since I've been here. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your job and your day-to-day -day activities. Yeah. What do you do? So what do I do? So I look at my job as securely enabling the business. Yes. It's about risk and figuring out what the business wants to do and how can I help them do that in the most secure way. I don't think of my job as protecting, defending, inhibiting, restricting people from doing what they need to do. It's about helping them do it in the best, most secure fashion. You said that right off the bat. As soon as you said enabling the business, I was yes. like, that's a little bit different than a lot of security, which is, hey, let's block everything yes, and stop yeah. as much as we can. And, that's right. And we also stop a lot, and we'll talk about that yeah, in a minute, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. But tell me a little bit about the network that you're protecting. Obviously, Cisco is a pretty massive company. We're pretty big. You 50 know. some odd billion dollars, 170 countries, uh, one global network. Yeah. Um, so when I go to San Jose to my office, or I go to Shanghai, or San Paulo, or wherever I go in the world, and I open up my laptop, I'm on that one global network. That's true. And I've been fortunate enough to travel around and boom, it's like everything's right there That's no right. matter where I'm at. I just That's have right. to figure out which VPN concentrator is the closest. And <laughs> then it's a well, if you're in the office, there's no VPN concentrator. Right. Uh, it, uh, myself and 26,000 other employees, when they go home, there's no VPN to deal with. You yeah. just walk into your house, you open up your laptop and you're on that same global network. Yeah. And I tell that story often because uh, I remember when we wanted to do that. It's about a global company, employees working late at night, off hours, yeah. and they wanted a good experience. Sure. And this is an example of enabling the business, was putting these devices, uh, CBO routers in 26,000 people's homes. Yep. My team freaked out. It's like, <laughs> you're going to put a router, it's not locked up in a closet, blah, 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 all the security concerns. They're going to drop it. And, and, uh, and we thought about it and we said, well, most Cisco employees are pretty smart. They don't let random people, <laughs> you're an exception, it's okay. <laughs> uh, they don't let random people come in their house and wander around, so it's not a locked closet, but it also isn't a open public place. Yeah. So there's a risk, but how, how bad was it? In reality, what I think I learned was, um, when employees go home, they open up their laptop, they stay on the network. Yeah. And, and they use it, and they do the Amazon, and they do their Netflix, and all of those kinds of things on our network, and I'm okay with that, because when something goes wrong, because it does, we're able to see it and do something much faster. So I think, because people spend more time on our network versus off network, we're actually more secure than if we force people to go through the gyrations of connecting to A great people. example of enabling yes. and leveraging what we have there. And I've even clicked on a thing or two out of Facebook and like, there comes the notice right. like, oh. Then I get a read all into it. Now yeah. I forgot even what I was clicking on because that's more interesting, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's because you're a security geek. I am a security nerd for yeah. sure. Uh, now all of this, you're, you're talking about the vastness of our network and yeah. how many people and employees. Surely this is a huge team effort. What is part of your mantra and how do you get everybody on board to, to view yeah. the importance of security? Yeah, so um, I think uh, one of the most important skills a CISO could have is interpersonal skills. Sure. And I'm still working on mine, but. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing uh, it, all right so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's about building partnerships, about building trust, gotcha. about getting people aligned on the same outcomes and the same goals, and and so for me, that partnership is incredibly valuable. Yeah. I'm not part of IT, um, I'm part of an uh, ops organization that has responsibility for every product we build and ship, um, every cloud we build and operate for our customers, every IT system we build and operate, and uh, all the data that we consume and use to run our business and support our customers. Yeah. And and in that, none uh, of the operations 
that actually build and run those things are part of our team. <laughs> so it's about partnerships. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, I think, uh, what makes it success successful is we approach it as how do we help them, how do we partner with them, how do we enable them to do what they want to do, but also give them clarity about what they need to do, uh, why they need to do it, and helping uh, through uh, processes, through technology, through code, helping them do what they're trying to do in the most secure fashion. Everything you've said so far has been a little bit of a surprise that, uh, from what I would have expected, which is, I got to lock things down. Wait, I can't do that because yep. it's insecure. Your first words, and now you're even talking about it in your partnerships and your enablement with other yep. teams that don't report to you, is I'm here to help. How can I help enable right. in a secure fashion? And that's the way that things have, have really needed to change for a long time. Yep. So hopefully the rest of the CISOs out there <laughs> are hearing that kind of message. Yeah. But tell me a little bit about, uh, surely we've got, uh, you talked a lot about process and some of the metrics that you're using. I know that you're kind of a metrics driven guy. We've, in some of the presentations that I've seen from, from your past. Yeah. So tell me about what are some of the things that you track and why are those important? Yeah, so uh, I, think about, I think there's several things that we uh, try to use. The metrics aren't for me. They're for visibility for others to understand, are they doing the right thing, are they not doing the right thing, um, are they doing it on time, et cetera. So one of the metrics that uh, I'll share with all of you was, uh, uh, what we call unified security metrics. And it was a project we did with IT several years ago when I took on this role. Um, uh, I went and met all my new team, how you doing, what do you do, um, are you having fun? And I met with the Vuln management team. Okay. And they showed me how they could scan the entire global network, find all the vulnerabilities every day, blah, 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 it was awesome. And they were really proud of it, but they were really frustrated because they would produce this beautiful report, bring it to their friends in IT who had this round file cabinet, <laughs> and they'd drop it right in the trash. And, <laughs> and, and I went to IT and I said, dudes, what's up? And their answer was, uh, that's not my priority. This gets back to that partnership. Mm -hmm. And then I agreed with our CIO at the time, what were the metrics that she would hold her staff accountable to around this vulnerability and patching and management. And we agreed on two metrics. How many vulnerabilities do you have in whatever you're running? Okay. And did you fix it on time or not? Were they repaired on time, yes. patched on time? Yeah, we call it uh, on time closure. Um, and those two metrics allowed us to get uh, that as a priority, like uptime or availability. It was the same level of importance and everybody in IT knows about that. Uh, and um, once we implemented that, the first full year, we were able to decrease the number of vulnerabilities in the environment by 64% and increase on-time closure by over 86%. And as we've grown the number of things we look at and number of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, systems that we're monitoring in this way, we've been able to maintain it because it's now embedded in the process and the culture, and it is a priority. Because you've tied these two groups together yes. with there. Well, that's good management right there, for sure. Uh, it was lucky, Some, somebody <laughs> thought about it. <laughs> Let's get a little bit, little bit more security focused sure. specifically. Tell me about some of the latest threats that you've been keeping an eye on, some of the things that we've been exposed to or, or that are trying to hack us as an organization. What, what are the latest threats you've been watching out for? Yeah, you know, I think um, the way I think about that is the threats just are adapting. Uh, you might have a particular piece of malware and somebody adapts it and changes it, and so it's not as much as brand new unique things. I think the cyber criminals are uh, opportunistic, uh, they want to leverage, you know, all of those kinds Low of things. Low-hanging fruit. For yep, sure. so they still do that, but the reality is cyber crime is a, depends on what study you look at, but roughly six trillion dollar, that's with a T, a trillion dollar industry globally. The IT industry itself is about three trillion. <laughs> so it's twice the size of the IT industry. Security, security is probably half a trillion or you so. Know, I, I should I know that, but. Yeah, I should too. But, but that's a factor of six X larger than. The, so the reality is it's big business sure. and they're constantly innovating. They use cloud. 
they use messaging, they use uh, social media, they use all of those things to figure out how to penetrate our networks, and phishing is still the number one vector that they use. They're just always trying new ways of doing that. We should tweak it. Yeah, there's, from the, bar, the very earliest phishing attempts that yep. we remember about the prince in Nigeria with the broken <laughs> English and the email. Yeah. And I still yeah. get those from time to time, it's by the way. Still yeah. out there, that means yeah. somebody is clicking yep. on it, somebody yep. is making money off of it. But, uh, but yeah, we were talk to, talking earlier with Darren about how email is still the number one threat vector, and we did another episode about that earlier yeah, today. Awesome, so awesome. Let our viewers check that out there at their leisure. But, uh, but tell us about the products that you use to defend against all of these threats out there. Yeah. And you know, I think you know where I'm going with this is, uh, the big question is, well this is our Cisco CISO, so is it just default Cisco, everything we make goes right into the network? So, so I am a big Cisco shop. Mm -hmm. um, I love our products. I have a really great relationship with the security business group. Okay. Um, IT, the business group, and I meet every six weeks. And we talk about three topics. One, number one, what are we deploying and is it working? Okay. Is it manageable? Is it scalable? We give them that honest, direct feedback. Yep. Uh, number two, they tell us what they're going to build new. Mm -hmm. And we talk about whether that's going to be good or valuable or not, and hitting the mark or not, hitting the mark or not, and then number three, we talk two or three years out, what do we need to be thinking about? And so <clears throat> we have that as a regular conversation. Um, and yes, I do deploy a lot of Cisco technology. I use most of it, um, but I put it through its paces. Um, we call ourselves customer zero. Okay. And what we're trying You're to almost our alpha customer, oh, and then we like have beta. An and that's right. That's right. Maybe and even pre-alpha. Uh, often pre-alpha. Sometimes yeah. we'll just put it in a couple of labs and uh, let them see how the efficacy of the tool, how it works in in that environment. Then we'll put a small deployment. Then we'll do big deployments. If it doesn't work for us, um, then. Um, we back to the drawing back board. to the drawing board, and yeah. they start again until it can work. Um, and I also, you know, I look at the portfolio of uh, my architecture, and I say, where's the gaps? Yeah. And then I bring in third parties to fill those gaps as well. Sure. Um, and we use a number of third party. We don't do products. everything. We don't do everything, and I think that's part of uh, where I've been very. Uh, pleased with the way the product team is moving in terms of an integrated architecture, things working together, uh, and and because I look at it as an ecosystem. I have an ecosystem. The more things that work together, and the three three things that I tell the BU every day is make sure it works. Um, make sure I have visibility. If it's a black box, it doesn't help me understand what's going on in the network, it's not very useful. And number three, is it integrated with the rest of my ecosystem? How can they make that happen? Because if I have to do it, I'm spending time and energy that I don't want to spend uh, integrating things, I want to do security. Or, or not being able to do it at all would be even worst case yeah. scenario, which is I think what a lot of our customers face. Now I talk about that a lot because I've done a lot of yep. portfolio marketing for Cisco and how our technologies integrate and work yep. together and share information because I think the initial phase of our rededication to security was get the right components on the, yeah. on the sheet. Number one, they had to work. Yeah, the, yeah, we had to have the best of breed technologies, but then the phase that we are into more right now is how do we get these things to talk to each other and share information yeah. about events or policies or users or devices yeah. and all of that context so that, uh, and even the events that are coming out of it, so that we can share that information and have more of an automated ecosystem. Yeah. And so it sounds to me like you took those words out of my mouth a little bit so that, that you're <laughs> looking for that. So, so I'm not even going to mess with that yeah. question, so perfect. And I think the BU, you know, their first success there was AMP. Yeah. And AMP was everywhere across yes. the network, and it gave us uh, a really great uh, uh, tool and visibility, and it was integrated, it worked at machine speed. Um, I now see it with AnyConnect, Duo, AMP, and um, Umbrella in the cloud. Oh. And they're all integrated, so I now get this on-network, off-network clarity uh, it's, uh, of what's going on. I get the policies deployed, whether you're on or off network, and, uh, and they all work together as a integrated solution to give me the sort of mobile worker experience that we need. 
Perfect, perfect. And as a mobile worker, I appreciate yeah. that as well. So uh, tell me a little bit about, you've mentioned the, the cloud aspects of some yep. of our technologies, which is important. A lot of our technologies are actually moving to the cloud. As the applications are moving to the cloud, how many applications do you see us using at Cisco that are cloud-based apps? Yeah, so when I think about cloud, uh, I think about two things. Clouds I consume and clouds I build. Okay, that's true, right? Right. We build, and most people don't, under, don't realize this, we build and operate 70 clouds for our customers. Jeez. Umbrella, AMP. WebEx, AMP, CTR, they all have yeah. a cloud component and that's just increasing. So we can talk about how do I build secure clouds and then we consume to run the business about 400 cloud services. So, Salesforce, wow. uh, Box, uh, O365, uh, uh, ADP Payroll, I mean, they're all cloud services that we consume. So when we're going to consume a cloud, mm -hmm. um, we do a couple of things. First, we look at what's the criticality of the data, the sensitivity of the data. Right. Number two is what's the criticality of the business process, right. and based on that, we have three tiers of reviews that we go through. If it's low risk and low risk data, not a critical process, it's a process that gets filled out and automated in a couple, two days, you're moving forward. If it's critical data, customer data, a critical process like uh, uh, all TAC cases and all that, mm -hmm. well, then they're going to get a lot of inspection, they're going to get uh, uh, requirements about integrating with single sign-on, about uh, all kinds of encryption technology, and all of those expectations have to be there. More thorough vetting process. A real thorough vetting process, and a re-vetting. So the re-vetting is more often uh, than, say, a low priority uh, thing. For sure. That has really allowed us to bring those in and scale that as the business needs to change in a dynamic way. So that's another example of, of scaling, but doing it in a systematic way yep. uh, that allowed us to have the right visibility and control. And it gave us uh, also by leveraging partnerships with procurement, uh, accounts payable, and IT, w allowed us to see all the ones that people are trying to use, wanting to use, and be able to partner with them to figure out how to do it securely. Yeah. Now, it's a little off script, but what can yeah. you tell me about those clouds that we build? Because that is a fascinating topic. Yeah. And I know that, like I said, a lot of our technologies as security offerings are moving from an appliance to the cloud. Yep. And one of the big benefits in how we're doing that integration is sharing so much of that information is by leveraging those back-end cloud systems, whether they're storing yep. events, uh, information, policy, or doing the actual inspection. So, what has it been like to actually help build the security products from that perspective? Yeah. So we took a play out of the uh, products playbook, if you will. Uh -huh. um, we've been building products for 30 years. They're highly secure. There's a, a software development process, a design process, a partnership process to ensure that every piece of hardware we ship to a, a customer uh -huh. was authentic, originally designed, securely designed, when it is in their environment and it boots up, that it boots up Cisco stuff, exactly. so we have that whole process. So we took that and said, how does that apply to the cloud and what's different? And there's two things uh, that are different. Um, one, where you're developing. If you're developing a hardware product, it's inside our nice protected walls, generally. If I'm building a cloud, it's generally in the cloud. Yeah. Uh, and number two is I'm operating it. I'm not just building and shipping it. Yeah. And so those were two big things that we really had to think differently about uh, helping the business build those clouds. So in the first one, um, uh, we had a, a successful program we call Cisco Security Buddy. Um, it's, a, it's an internal security product. It has releases, it has release chains. I have a security product marketing person who markets it to the internal audience to use it. A tech writer to write up uh, how to use it and do those kinds of things. So product. we have to think of it as a product. Yeah. And essentially, um, if you want to develop on AWS or a, a, our private cloud or Google uh, cloud, um, Security Buddy is a set of guardrails that says in that environment, 
you need to lock this down, you need to have the flows like this, you need to do all these things. And what security teams used to do is write that down on a piece of paper and give it to you and say, make sure you read this and do that work. Yeah. We flipped that and said, we're going to build that. We're going to support it as the technology changes and release it as a security appliance, if you will, for the development team. Yeah. Um, we partnered with the procurement office to give them free, give the developers free access to build stuff in the cloud. It's relatively inexpensive to stand up a development environment. When you're in production, you're going to pay for it, but if we can centralize that, it meant people didn't have to swipe a card, didn't have to go through a PO process. That was a carrot. We gave them a way of setting it up really, really quickly and securely. Mm -hmm. um, and when we looked at the number of developers working in AWS was our first uh, uh, place that we did this. Um, in the first 30 days, we had over 50% of them migrated to ours. Partly the carrot of free, yeah. partly <laughs> the quick setup. Yeah. Um, within 90 days, we were well over 95% migrated over. So you know you did something good and helped them, and we know it was secure, um, and that's uh, one of the ways we are sort of helping accelerate that migration and transition that's so important to Cisco's I, business. I don't mean to be a dead horse, but it keeps going back to enablement. Yes, it I does. I think it's that your whole disposition of how can I help make these things happen uh, in a secure fashion, and then you create a very easy path for people to yep. migrate into your world with. So yep. make it seem like it was their idea. All right, I think I might be able to learn one or two things from that. Uh, tell me a little bit more about what we do when we have things that get through. Because I know, as much as everybody knows, and we preach this message all the time, yep. it's not if, but when, and no matter how great your security stack and everything you deploy is, yep. something is going to happen, you need to be able to have processes in place to yep. respond to that. What is that like in your office? <laughs> um, so, I have a, a mindset that I call 95-5. Um, there is no math, no science behind that, it's just to try to remember that I need good security technology deployed, yep. and we deploy about 1,200 security things in the network yep. um, that blocks and automatically defends 95% of the time. Right. But I know 5% of the time bad things are going to happen, sure. and I need to be able to find it, understand the scope of it, the impact of it, and do something about it. And so to do that, we, that's where visibility, and I mentioned that earlier, is so important. How do I get visibility to what's happening in the network? So things like uh, Stealth Watch, like uh, Umbrella, and uh, the insights that you get from that, uh, things like uh, the uh, Threat MTD, I can't remember the... CTR? CTR, thank you. Cisco yes. Threat I can't Response. Remember, yes, I can't remember all the TLAs. Cisco <laughs> Threat Response, those all give me visibility. We collect about four terabytes of data, off the network every day. It's 20 different data sources. Yeah. Uh, it's about 20 billion net flows a day. It's every log that the WSA, ESA sees, and we put that into a big repository. And then we run plays. And a play is really four things. What's important? What is the thing I need to defend? What are the kinds of attacks that might happen against it? So think Cisco.com, uh, our AD infrastructure, our finance services. There are different kinds of attacks that might happen to each of those kinds of things. So what kind of attack happens? What data would I use to detect it? Mm -hmm. and, and know with high fidelity that that is a cyber attack. And number four, what do I do when I see it? And we run those plays, there's about 250 uh, to 275 plays, we run them, and an analyst looks at the result. And based on that result, they can do one of three things. Number one, all clear on the western front, move on to the next one. Okay. Number two, they can take an action like quarantine your laptop because you got a piece of malware on it. Okay. Number three, they can kick it up to a senior analyst, so our in, our analysts are new hires, they're contractors, they can just run the plays and do the action. Yep. The investigators know how to build plays, they understand how threats work. They're 10-year uh, veterans. Tier one support. Tier one. 
and they get together and they look at it and they might determine that it's a false positive. Mm -hmm. Then they work together to tune that, to remove the false positive. Now the, uh, the early and career person learns and we're improving the quality and efficacy of each play. Yes. Or the investigator takes it over because it's a serious event. Yeah. Um, if you look at uh, breaches, the average time uh, before a breach is known is around 160 days. Time to detect. Time to detect, 160 days. Kind that, of a problem. That's a, and it's, uh, it's better than what a lot of reports say are out there. It could be six months and a year, it's things like that. But. We run this play, we look at the, the results of this, and over the last several years, we went from 36 hours to 24 to 12, to now we're averaging under nine hours time to detect. Okay. So that's from the time that a person clicks on an email and it starts, or uh, a misconfigured server gets uh, tapped on right. or whatever, nine hours, okay. versus the industry average of 160 days. Okay. If I can do that, then um, we can be more flexible, more agile in letting the business do what they need to do because I have a way of detecting things and then containing them so that they don't spread and become big problems. So is that different or the same from the time to remediate? Do you track that one differently? Uh, so time to remediate is interesting. I focus on time to contain because okay. that's what I, my team can do. Right. If I need IT to rebuild something, that might take days. If they have to re-architect it, it could take a year. Right. So the time to remediate is the time to completely remediate. The time to contain is how long does it take my team to ensure that no damage can continue, that it can't spread, et cetera. And so we focus on that because that's what we can control. This is a fascinating conversation. Yeah. I love the way that you've walked me through everything that just happens from the time that we may get actually penetrated to the time that we have complete uh, yeah. containment. Containment. Fantastic. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more, shifting gears just a, a smidge, about what you see going forward in the world of network security and in the future, what does your crystal ball look like? <laughs> what, what, what should we be looking out for and what's next down the road for the development of uh, your organization specifically or in the world in general? Yeah, so uh, I don't have a crystal ball, I'm not that smart, um, but what I do see because uh, I have the great opportunity to connect lots of customers lots of law enforcement and governments, and, and you get a lot of information from all of that. Um, what I do see is I think the pace of business is going to continue to rapidly evolve. Sure. Uh, the pace of technology is continuing to evolve, and those two set up a lot of great opportunities for security professionals. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's good job security and network security. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and I think what's, uh, uh, what's going to evolve is as we're seeing more cloud technology, uh, different uh, development approaches, that embedding security in the development process sure. is going to become uh, super important. So uh, I think we are pretty good at network security, we're pretty good at system security, how do I embed it in the development process, in the application, and understand that that application uh, is being used in a particular way uh, that might uh, give us insight that it's not really the person who think we think it is, yeah. or the, the container is uh, not working the way that it's, it's supposed to work. And so I think we're going to need to start to move up the application stack yeah. uh, and get more insights and more controls in those areas. Yep. And number two, um, I think we're going to have to think about how to get more granular in data protection. Gotcha. Uh, and, and how do we know the sensitive data from the unsensitive data? We're putting more and more data into big data lakes and into uh, you know, big data systems and all that data isn't the same. Yes. And if I'm accessing it and you're accessing it, it we may have different uh, rights to that data, we need to understand whether or not I can use the data the way I want to use it, not just can I have it, but can I use it uh, in a particular manner. Right. And so I think we're going to have to think about that and that's going to be people, 
and it's going to be processes, mm -hmm. and it's going to be tools, and, and it's the magic of how we bring all that together to enable the business to use those kinds of new techniques, yep. but do it in a way that honors the uh, agreements we have with the customer, if it's customer data, employee data, and protect our own intellectual property. And always enables. Yep. Uh, last question. Sure. What advice do you have out there for other CISOs? I mean, coming from, what are we, like Fortune 53 something like or that, something yeah. like that? <laughs> something It'll change like every year, but yeah. one of the largest companies yeah. in the world. What, do you, what advice do you have for other CISOs out there? Yeah. Uh, what words of, of wisdom do you, do you have to share? For uh, so I think uh, three things. Number one, um, uh, think about enabling the business. Understand where the company is trying, your company, your business is trying to go, what's important to them, and figure out how to enable that in a secure way. Number two, build partnerships. Um, you can't do this alone. Uh, uh, no security professional, no security team can do it alone. You got to get everybody in the boat with you, and so you have to build that network and that set of partnerships. And number three, the basics still matter. Sure. Patch, patch management, uh, configuration management, doing those basics. Blocking and tackling. Blocking and tackling, no rocket science required. <laughs> um, but doing that will greatly improve the overall security of your environment. So I think it's those three things. Words of wisdom. Thanks. Steve, thanks so much for My coming pleasure. by. I mean, like I said, to have a guest to talk about how a security company protects a security company is a pretty unique opportunity. So I'm very grateful that you joined the My show. My pleasure, anytime. And I'm going to take you up on the opportunity to interview some of your other staff members and maybe get a little bit more deeper dives on yep. individual technologies and how we use them and what we've seen before and after and how they uh, I, respond to these threats and all those they, kinds of things. They'd love to do that and they're way smarter than I am so you'll get a lot of value out of Always that. Always find a great team. Well, thanks Good. so much for coming by. Thanks. I appreciate yep. you. Bye-bye. So, thanks so much for tuning into this episode of ThreatWise TV. I've been Jason Wright from Cisco Live in San Diego. Tune in out and we'll catch you next time. All right, outstanding. <laughs>